Okay, um, I'm Kurt de Georgia. I don't know how many of you out there know who I am, but um, I'm kind of mainly known as a techno producer from the UK, but I've uh, dabbled in uh, a couple of different genres. Um, my main pseudonym is As One. Uh, I've done albums for Moax, Ubiquity, Versatile. I've done albums as Future Past for uh, RNS and a few other labels. And uh, I've done music under my own name for a uh, new religion label. Uh, so uh, you might have seen those names around. That's who I am. And uh, how's, how's the rehearsals going for tomorrow night? Uh, the rehearsals are going fine. I'm using this laptop, so he's got to come and fix it because I'm using it tomorrow. So uh, I don't know what you've done to it. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, the kind of thing that's sending chills down my spine whenever I'm in the rehearsal and I hear what uh, those arrangers have done with, with a couple of my compositions. Have you ever been in a situation like that before? Have you ever had an experience like that, hearing someone interpret your, your music? Only within? once before, which was uh, as equally as emotional, actually. Um, I did a co-write with uh, fellow Cootie's drummer, uh, Tony Allen, and he performed it live in Paris. And for me, that was a bit of a, mm. you know, a head trip as well. So uh, only once before, but never on this scale. You know? mm. So for those, of, for those people that aren't familiar with your music, obviously your influences reach far and wide, as we're about to find out. But musically, as a producer, how would you best describe the music you make? Um, I would say uh, it's pretty eclectic. You can't really categorize it easily mm -hmm. but I would say it's soulful electronic music <laughs> but sometimes it's not even electronic so uh, mm -hmm. it's just music it's really hard for me to uh, categorize my my style and um, I think the record stores have a problem with where to put my albums usually as well and do you find that's a problem you know being someone who produces electronic music under various different styles that you know you can't do you feel it would be kind of easier if you did have a category it would be easier for the record shops to sell it, but as an artist it's great because um, I can keep people guessing. Um, no one's going to have any preconceived ideas about what my albums are going to be like because mm -hmm. it could be anything. So um, um, artistically, which is what my main interest is, it's, it's an advantage. Whereas marketing and promotion and mm. uh, that kind of thing is probably a disadvantage. Mm. So let's talk about some cornerstones in, you know, your musical influences because I know that basically makes you who you are musically mm, and yeah. um, you wanted to touch on that. Yeah. Um, the big thing that happened to me, um, I don't know how young you guys and girls were when you first had that revelation about music, but it happened to me when I was 11 years old. I don't really remember knowing anything about music or caring about music until I was 11 years old when I used to go and visit my aunt in London. I lived about an hour away. And um, she used to go to these uh, soul clubs in, in London. And just the fact that she used to come in late and talk about these great nights where everyone, you know, had a great time and I was 11, I used to just think, wow, I can't wait to go and do what she does. And I used to hear the music coming out of her bedroom when she was getting ready to go out or, you know, the next day or whatever. And it was all music that I'd never heard before in my life. You didn't hear the music on television, didn't hear it on the radio. And um, one day she just kind of grew up and grew out of it. And she gave me, in 1979, she gave me a stack of seven inches, about this tall. And uh, I used to play them on my mum's record player. And they were things like James Brown, Sly Stone, uh, Earth, Wind and Fire, Calling the Gang. It was all kind of uh, quite mainstream, commercial black music that had been successful in the clubs in England. And where are you living at this point? I was living in Ipswich. I'd, we. <laughs> I was born in London, but after about four years, my mum wanted to bring me up in a, a more rural environment, so we went out to Ipswich. And how did that affect what access you had to music? Luckily, Ipswich is still within range of the London radio shows, um, mm. which, is, which is incredibly lucky because I think that's one of the main reasons and influences on people's taste in music when they're young is what they can hear at home on the radio. And, um, Ipswich was only 60 miles from London, so I could just about 
pick up the radio stations mm. of London. And also there was a lot um, of early pirate stations around Essex and Kent. Mm. And they were real sort of purest soul stations. So I started reading magazines like Blues and Soul and Echoes and uh, just being able to see the same artists that my auntie had given me. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I used to read about the radio shows in the listings. And I used to tune in and then I used to buy those little C90 cassette things. And my mum gave me a little tape deck that had an external microphone. And I used to put the microphone right up to the radio speaker and just pray that she didn't go, Kirk, your dinner's ready or whatever, you know, while yeah. a song was on. And I used to tape all those radio shows. Yeah for like two, three years. I mean, radio was really, you, we were, well, I'm from London too, so we were lucky mm. to have access to, um, to, to that pirate radio. Can you just fill people in on the, the spectrum of music that you might hear across the dial on every, any given weekend? Yeah, um, it, was, it was mainly American soul and disco and boogie, what we call boogie in, in, in the UK. And the, I don't know if you've heard of the DJs, Robbie Vincent, Mm -hmm. And um, there was Chris Hills and uh, Froggy. He was uh, a great, great underground DJ, still going today. And um, they, had, they had the shows. Uh, Greg Edwards, he was an American, but he'd come to England. And he had a show on Capital Radio. And they used to just play things like this. You know, joining the dots with all the, the different productions and the names that people went under. And uh, yeah. I used to sometimes, when I was maybe a year later, I used to save some dinner money and buy some seven inches. Yeah. But um, I couldn't afford 12 inches of these things. They're American imports, so you couldn't really find them that well in Ipswich. We had one import store. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And what else in that period was, you know, because I think the, the, the range of music is the key to your musical DNA, isn't it? Um, yeah, it was, actually it was, it was all about what was um, popular in the clubs at that time because those radio stations were mainstream, mm. you know, they were on Capital at the prime time on Saturday night and um, so they did reflect what was really popular in the club, so you'd hear the main labels like West End mm -hmm. and Sal Soul and you'd hear things like this on a uh, <laughs> disco tune but it was probably the first ever rap record. And a couple of weeks later, Sugar Hill Gang brought out Rapper's Delight. And so immediately I was aware that within even uh, the, the kind of uh, narrow disco and soul, there was other genres as well. Even from that very early stage, I thought, right, okay, there's, you can subdivide it up. I mean, people subdivide it up like, crazy now but in those days I was I was aware of that so there was different strands and and I was open-minded then I didn't hear rap and think that sounds terrible I thought that sounds different I don't really understand it but it's interesting and you know I like it so um, whereas a lot of the soul DJs hated that music at the time they were so purist you know they said it wasn't singing you know it was just someone shouting um, but then you know, uh, Grandmaster Flash and all that came along. And uh, the eclecticism really started then, and especially in 82 <coughs> when I heard Planet Rock. And that was, that was the biggest head trip for me since my auntie gave for the records, was, was hearing something that I knew was, was funk, um, but it was like something I'd, I'd never heard of. It was all electronic. It was really repetitive. It had a rip of another record that I knew was a European band. Mm. It, was, it was just insane. And again, for some reason, you know, I don't really know why. I wasn't, you know, totally open-minded to everything at that time, but I really wanted to get into that. Whereas a lot of the soul DJs, they formed this thing called LADS, League Against Disco Shit, which was basically the old soul DJs would refuse to play electro records. Really? Some of those DJs are now huge dance music producers. Right. I'm not going to name them, but... But that's an, interesting, <laughs> that's an interesting period because lots of people in this room probably started getting into music or going out after 
the dance music period had really begun. So it's always been a part of our lives, you know? Yeah. It's, you know, we've always known about clubs and BPMs and mixable records and quantized music, yeah. you know, and electronic, yeah. you know, culture. Yeah. But there was a point, wasn't there, where people who are now, you know, certainly first generation house and techno DJs before that, were, they were playing soul and jazz and rare groove and whatever else you call it. I yeah. mean, what was the point where electronic music and electronic parties, be it house, techno, or whatever, yeah. started to really take over? Um, they started to take over in uh, 88, in the summer of love, after you know, ecstasy became popular in the UK from, from the Balearic Islands, from Ibiza or whatever. Um, but I think there's still a continuous strand back from an early period, because um, the first time I was aware of like, electronic manipulation and and other ways to make records out of the conventions of soul and jazz was hearing uh, adventures of Grandmaster Flash on the Wheels of Steel and Double D and Steinsky's Lesson One, you know? Mm -hmm. That was, it was clearly uh, made with, with, you know, electronics, um, turntables and editing material and um, for me, I was kind of, that gave me my grounding in unconventional ways and electronic ways of, of hearing soul funk music. Yeah. And so when, when that whole rave kind of house music period took over, for me, it wasn't as a bigger re a revolution and revelation as it was to some other people, I think. Because for me, it was just a continuation. Mm. Mm. So, but you're right, there was, there was a time when you had the conventional soul, jazz, jazz funk DJs suddenly started being more open-minded. I don't know if it was because they had uh, drug experience or whatever. We had Theo Parrish here the other day talking about um, the significance of the Midwest and the impact mm. that that's had on so many people's lives musically, whether that be Chicago, Detroit. Mm. That's definitely true for you, isn't it? Cause, um, mm -hmm. What was, the, what was the significant point for you in terms of deciding that you really wanted to get into making electronic music? Well, um, when I left uh, university, I went to work in a record shop because uh, I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. So I worked in a second-hand record shop in London and um, they used to send staff to America uh, to buy, you know, rare soul and jazz, and ship it back and sell it. So um, they sent a couple of us out in 1990, and um, I, was, I was just the Detroit techno head by then. You know, uh, the records weren't that popular at the time. It was a very small scene, but I was just totally into it. And uh, also the house thing. A few of the rare house uh, early tracks and DJ International was, were uh, selling well in the shop. So they sent us to Chicago, and... Uh, I had a couple of friends with me. We hired a car and we used to drive drive around Chicago. Um, we went to uh, see Derek Carter in Gramophone Records at the time. He told us to go to a few distribution places. So we went down to Barney's Warehouse on the uh, south side and uh, we went to Tracks. We went to DJ International, saw Tyree, and uh, it was all, uh, we went to Gherkin. I don't know if you remember the Gherkin label. We, we went and saw all those guys and you know, we bought a lot of records, we bought a lot of soul at the little, you know, out of the way stores and stuff. And um, I just met Derek May about two weeks previously in, in, in London. And I had a Transmat t-shirt on. I felt this big, strong hand come down on my shoulder, say, you know, where the fuck do you get that t-shirt? I was like, oh God. And uh, he said, I'm only kidding. He says, uh, I know it's a bootleg, doesn't matter. You know, hi, whatever. Um, and I was like, I'm your biggest fan, you're the usual, you know, sort of crap. And uh, I told him I was gonna be in Chicago, and he said, make the drive to Detroit. It's only like four or five hours drive, you know. If you can make it, I'll be there. I'll take you around some record stores in Detroit that no one's ever been to. And I was like, okay, got his address. So when I was in Chicago, everyone I met, I was saying, we're going to go to Detroit. And they're like, don't go to Detroit. It's like, why? And they're saying, don't go to Detroit, it's dangerous. It's like, what? 
and uh, they're going, seriously, do not go to Detroit. Not in a hire car, not with three of your friends. Just don't go. We just, you know, we didn't give a shit. So we drove to Detroit. We drove in. First stop I made was at a place called Byright. And, uh, you know, bought loads of great records. And uh, we said, we're looking for Grasher Avenue, Derek May's place. And they said, yep. You know, just uh, go down the end of the street, take a right, head towards downtown, and uh, you'll see, they call it, you know, Techno Boulevard, a little corner. And uh, we were all excited and stuff, and we went down, and it was a bit scary for a, a you know, um, a white kid from, from the suburbs of England. It got, you know, it looked pretty scary, just run down and kind of burnt out and stuff. I thought, shit, you know, we, where am I going? And anyway, we parked up, and there's this big metal door with Metroplex written on it. So we're like, oh God, hammered it on the door. And this big guy opens the door, yeah, what do you want? And it's uh, Shake, Anthony Shakir. And we're like, we're from England, we want to come and see Derek May and all this. And he, he just rolled his eyes and just shouted, one, there's some crazy English people who've come all the way to see us, you know, like, uh, and heard one go, bring them in. And uh, they treated us so nicely, it was incredible. Mm. And I, that was the first time I kind of been exposed to that kind of media perception of some of the areas in America where they think you're just gonna get killed, you know, just because it's a black area or whatever. It was, if someone turned up at my house and come all the way from England, I'd like to think that I'd be that friendly, but you know, I doubt it, you know, they were incredible. They welcomed us in, we stayed there for like, two days they took us to the market opposite to get some food they uh, let us look through their record collections we bought a few records off one he had some rare west end disco things that this that one atkins right? yeah there was uh shake one and uh kevin saunderson was next door i think shade the mirror was there by then uh, there was marty bonds he was uh um he was working with one on some tracks and uh then they called this english guy down they said, oh, there's an English guy already here. He's been here for a few months called Matt Cogger. And I don't know if you ever heard of Matt Cogger, Neuropolitik, but he was the first European to go over there to Detroit and check those guys out. And he was running Transmat for Derek while Derek was touring in, in England. And uh, I still know Matt to this day. He's not doing music anymore, but... Uh, Have you got like, a, a record from that period, from, from that scene? Just um, I have. It's in. It's in uh, Ableton. Are we going to play that later? Yeah, if we you want to do it later. Yeah, yeah we can. Yeah. We can play that later. Okay. If we're going to open Ableton right. in a minute. Um, but um, that's an important time because there's. This, it kind of brings us on to your production mm -hmm. career because I believe some of the first equipment you were using had something to do with that trip as well, right? Yeah. Well. Um, Matt ran Transmat for Derek and eventually Derek came back and Matt had to go back to England and uh, he, he had some of Derek's keyboards and he didn't have any studio space so the revelation to me was going to Detroit and seeing the equipment that Juan used to make mm. those Model 500 records. Mm. Seeing and I mean as far as influences go, Model 500 and, and, and Rhythm is Rhythm and those things are mm. seminal records for you. Yeah, right? they were like the classics, you yeah. know, um, for us. They were, obviously Strings of Life was massive, it is what it is was quite massive, feel surreal, but Model 500 was still quite underground mm. and not that many people were, were into it. Um, but seeing the equipment setups that they had, seeing what Derek made, it is what it is with. Mm. Because I'd grown up with all that disco and stuff, I thought a rec recording studio would have to be like a 48 channel mixing desk. Mm. And I thought you had to have a mixing engineer and you had to have a producer and I'd see all the names listed and all the equipment. And I thought that was for rich people or for record labels to give to musicians. And I was neither, I was neither a rich kid and I wasn't a musician. So it never came into my head to, that I'd be doing music until I saw what these guys were using. And, uh, and what were they using? Uh, one had a Pro One. And a, what, what's, a, what's a Pro, Pro One? Pro One is like a, an early 80s sequential circuit made this, uh, it's quite small, like a monophonic keyboard with, it had a, it's got a sequencer on it. And it's, it makes those classic arpeggios in the Model 500 tracks. 
and um, obviously the 808 and um, reel to reel. I learned from Matt and Derek how to do those edits with the tape, with the yeah. razor blade. I, I didn't know anything about. It. I didn't know how Derek did those backwards bits. Just you know, didn't know how he did it. And uh, Matt showed me. He said, "Yeah, Derek does this, and you have to cut it across rather than like down here." And, mm. and the phase shifts because you're you know turning it upside down and everything. And it was it was all learning all this stuff, and it was all that made sense because of what I'd heard Double D and Steinsky and and all those guys do. And I previously when when I was a kid and I used to tape those radio shows and I started buying my own records, I used to do pause button mixes. Yeah. I had a double tape deck that had an overdub facility and I had a deck. So you'd play one record on the tape, record that, and then play the deck over the top. And I'd vary speed by speeding up with my finger or, mm. or putting pressure because the deck was just my mum's. And um, then when you'd get the mix right, you'd, you'd lift the pause button off and you'd record it. And then you'd find a, a point at which you'd want to stop yeah. the mix and m let the main record play. And you'd put the pause button on again and then put another mix in and then release the pause yeah. button. I used to make like 30 minute mixes that would take me weeks to build up. Yeah, yeah. So I would already kind of dabbled in it, but as for making music, because I wasn't a musician, I never thought I'd do it. But mm. And I saw when you had a sequencer, you didn't need to play anything. So when did you start making music? When I got back, I sold all my records, my whole record collection. Um, I got off about Why? because I didn't have any money to to do to do um, buy the studio equipment. The only and, thing I had worth anything was my records. And how much did that afford you to? I mean, what what were you able to buy? It was quite a lot actually. It was about three grand that wow. I got. Um, I bought an Atari. Uh, with Notator, I think at the time, mm -hmm. um, can't remember, or it might have been Opcode Vision. I'm not sure. Can't remember. Um, I bought an R8, the Roland drum machine, which was, which was kind of the latest drum machine. It was expensive at the time. I bought an S950 Akai sampler, which had quite a lot of memory. Um, I so you weren't playing. You did all right. You got, you got, you got kitted out. I did. Yeah. 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 And um, what was the first record you made? Um, the first record I made was um, a record called Dance Intellect, and I put it under my future past name. And already I had the name worked out. This was going to be my early influences, but I'm going to bring that to techno. Mm. Um, I had a broken 303. I can't remember what was broken about it. I think the envelope didn't work properly. Mm. But, um, and I, I just looped. A 303 riff that I made and then reversed it. Have you got it here? No, I haven't got it. It's, uh, it's Have on you got anything well. from that period that can give us an yep, example sure. of where your head was at? Then the second record I ever did was this. And I really make a difference, and uh, mm. if I keep on messing around, I'm never going get to get it done. Mm. And um, I have no answer. I know a lot of people have come to me before and said, I can never finish, finish every, anything, I'm never satisfied with it. I always think I can change this sound or that sound. And mm. I kind of think I could be dragged into that. So I, in my recording process, I make decisions really early. And I do things that I can't change, like I print to audio really quickly, instead of having, having it as a MIDI file, you know, that I can change the sound to a million different things and say, I wonder if this one sounds better, I wonder if that, yeah, yeah, I yeah. don't get, that's, you know, I don't like to get trapped into that, so I'll just choose a sound, lay it down and have to deal with that. Okay, so you started out on this basic equipment, let's fast mm. forward to 2006 and beyond, what, are you, what is your weapon of choice these days? in terms I, uh, of making music? I had more equipment then than I do now. Um, all I've got now is uh, a real big modular synthesizer um, made by uh, Bruce Duncan uh, Modcan up in, uh, in Canada. And um, that's, that's the only piece of, of like outboard synthesizer gear that I've got. Everything else is, um, I use Pro Tools, and I use uh, native instruments. And that's the only equipment that I've got. Mm. OK. Well, I mean, to people that aren't familiar with you know, the, the techno history mm. that you're talking about, 
they, and certainly people that aren't familiar with the music, they might find it strange that in the same breath you're talking about jazz, soul, and mm -hmm. funk, and you know, soulful music. Yeah. And then to what some people might seem like quite cold electronic music. You mm -hmm. know, how do you bring warmth and emotion to, and that same mm -hmm. soul into the electronic world? Well, um, that statement is, is kind of, it's true, but it's, to me it's bizarre because when I hear um, it is what it is, mm. or, or our time, or um, Night Drive Through Babylon, or, or something, you know, like uh, Journey of the Dragons, they're emotional records, yeah. and they've got a hell of a lot of soul and warmth. And to me, that's what techno is. You know, but unfortunately, techno isn't defined by what I think it is. It's what it's become. And like you say, cold kind of is the thing that's associated with techno. But, you know, the original blueprint for, for techno for me was kind of cold, but it was emotional alienation and, you know, the city that it grew out of. Mm. It was all about that kind of the soulful history, but a city that's gone into chaos and decline. Mm. And there is a huge emotion in that. Unfortunately, techno is often now associated with just noises, and those noises organised into into like a club sound or mm. or uh, you know kind of a, a atonal kind of structure. Mm. That's not what techno meant for me. That's not what I got into techno mm. for. Techno was still that emotional kind of soulfulness yeah and the the beats were the the hard funk edge to it but over the years you've um, been associated with various different musical styles from drum and bass broken beat um techno house whatever and you know musical peers you've done work with the likes of Digo from four hero and carl craig and mm. i mean can you tell me a little bit about your musical peers and mm -hmm. and um the different styles that you're involved with mm -hmm. well um there was a period after I'd made a couple of techno albums where techno really got into that European rave thing where everything was pitched up to like 140 BPM and it became very rigid and it had very little to do with what I was originally into techno for. And um, I was just, you know, kind of a bit jaded and not, you know, frustrated at going to the record shop and never finding the records that I liked. Techno was bigger than ever. You know, that was, mm. the, people say the peak of techno was 94, 95. I just could not find the inspirational records to go out and DJ with or to, to listen to. And, um, as you know, I listened to all kinds of music at, at home and um, it, it just, I've always been open-minded. And um, when I first heard uh, drum and bass, it was more like, it was too ravey and a bit gimmicky. You know, it was speeded up kind of chipmunk voices. It was quite sort of very, very kind of uh, for, for kids. And I, I was kind of aloof to it. And, Is uh, this kind of jungle era or yeah. more breakbeat hardcore era? Um, I, don't, I don't really know what names you would call it, oh, actually, right. at that stage. But this would be 94. OK. Some of my friends were making those records mm. um, to make money, you know. And um, I was around there when when one of, one of a great techno producer would, would make these records, we'd be rolling around on the floor laughing. And it was purely, you know, for, for making money to fund his techno label. And so I had a kind of really kind of uh, patronising view about that whole thing. But then I had to move back to Ipswich um, in 1995 for a, for a period. Mm. And drum and bass was huge in Ipswich. And they had a record store. And uh, I used to go and see my old friends to say hi. And I started hearing these, these amazing drum and bass tunes that weren't like any of the kind of rave and, you know, jungle that I'd heard before. And I bought a few of them, and I had about, you know, five, six or seven, and they were all by two people. They were either Peche or Fotec. And um, so I went back in the record shop and I said, who the hell are these guys? This, this music is amazing. It's like, you know, the chords are like the techno kind of influence and, mm -hmm. you know, the breaks, uh, you know, really, um, you know, they're kind of different to everything else I hear. And they told me, they said, oh, Fotek, yeah, he lives, lives up the road. It's like, what? He's, he's from Ipswich. Here's his number. So um, I called him 
and uh, you know, it was that usual thing. I'm, I've just heard some of his stuff from Real Fan, and he just knew everything about me, and knew everything about my label, knew all the early Detroit stuff, and said, "Come on, let's do some records together." Mm. And uh, uh, I went to his studio. He just had a sampler and an Atari, and um, I actually fell asleep because he would spend five hours doing the snare pattern, and you know, I'd, it would just be like, oh. and he was just meticulous about his EQing and everything, and it yeah. was. It, you it, can definitely hear that in his records. I've yeah. heard him in, in interviews as well, mm. always, you know, when they ask about his influences like Kirk, ART, mm. da da da. Well, so. there's, a, there's the famous track, KJZ, which is Kirk's Jazz, that's what it means. It's because oh, I right. gave him, uh, you know, I love giving Have tapes out. Uh, I haven't, no. Right. Um, I was just giving him um, stuff with, with drums on, to because yeah. um, I said, you know, your drums sound like Elvin Jones, and he, he kind of knew a bit about that but not really heavy so i just did you know i loved doing tapes for people and i'd give him you know some tapes and stuff and uh it was he found a few drum drum breaks yeah and that's why he kind of named that track after me after giving him some jazz things all right thanks very much Kirk. okay thanks Cheers. benji thank you, thank you.